Hello everyone, my name is Space Dirt, and this is the second episode of How to Make a Language. Last time, we went over getting a general overview of your phonology, using examples fitting certain vibes from which we could glean certain characteristics, ultimately leading to the creation of a phonemic inventory, in addition to a collection of various phonetic and phonological features. In this episode, we'll finalize the two example phonologies we started with, as well as take a closer look at allophony and phonological processes in general. Firstly, let's review allophony. As discussed in the previous episode, allophones are the various phones that make up a given phoneme. We also mentioned that each allophone occurs in a different phonological environment. This is called complementary distribution, where the two phones never appear in the same context, which means that the allophone that surfaces in a given word can be predicted from the structure of that word. Taking a look back at our P sound example from last time, we can see that which allophone surfaces is quite predictable. This contrasts with contrastive distribution, where the two sounds can occur in the same environment and are used to distinguish meaning. This indicates that the two phones are in different phonemic realms and are not allophones of a single phoneme. In addition, sometimes two sounds occur in the same environment, but don't change the meaning in any way. This is called free variation. For the purposes of this series, though, we'll mainly be focusing on allophones in complementary distribution. Anyway, let's get into some sound changes. The first one we're going to cover is assimilation. As the name implies, this change involves one sound becoming more similar to another sound, and is an extremely common change that occurs in many forms. Because of the sheer diversity, I'll go over a few different kinds. A very common example of assimilation is what we'll call nasal assimilation. In this process, a nasal coda assimilates to the same place of articulation as the onset of the following syllable. To illustrate this, let's look at the English word input. Although the general form of the prefix in ends in an alveolar nasal, when we use it in input, that coda n assimilates and becomes a bilabial nasal, matching the place of articulation of the p. Let's take a look at this in the context of our examples. Both language A and language B have codas, and since it fits the vibe of both relatively well and is so common, let's just add it to both languages. But we're not done with the assimilatory fun just yet. Let's dive into another very common sound change, palatalization. Palatalization can take a wide variety of forms, but the general gist is that the affected sound somehow moves closer to a hard palate in terms of place of articulation. This is usually triggered by something like a palatal approximate, a high vowel, or some other sort of palatal sound. This could take the form of a secondary articulation, confusingly also called palatalization, where the tongue is moved towards the hard palate during the production of the sound. As a quick side note, secondary articulations in general refer to a second form of articulation that occurs simultaneously with the primary articulation of the sound, and they can be a fun thing to mess around with. Examples include labialization, where the lips are rounded during the production of another sound, as well as the aforementioned palatalization and others. Anyway, palatalization, the sound change, can also result in a complete shift in place of articulation as well as a shift from a stop to an affricate, or even a fricative. There are many different possibilities. Let's say for language A, we'll keep it simple and have K become a palatal stop in front of I. I've also written out this particular change in sound change notation, though I haven't done this for the nasal assimilation just for the sake of brevity. Here, the greater than sign indicates a change, and the slash and what comes after shows the condition that causes the change, in this case, being before an I. But wait, if we look back at our first example of language A, we see that there's a K in front of an I, and we don't have this allophony. However, seeing as changing this doesn't really change the vibe, we can just go back in and change it. Something important to keep in mind during the conlanging process is that it's okay to change things. Not having K palatalize in front of I wasn't one of the goals that we set, and since it sounds fine and I like it, we can just add that in. We can always keep tweaking within the general vibe we've created until we get something refined that we're satisfied with. As a final assimilatory process, we can take a look at intervocalic voicing. Here, a voiceless consonant, often a stop or affricate, but sometimes a fricative as well, becomes voiced when surrounded by vowels, which is once again an extremely common process, especially in languages without phonemic voicing contrasts. However, if we look at language A, which doesn't have these voicing contrasts, we notice that obstruents are always voiceless, even intervocalically. 
Changing this feature changes the vibe we set originally quite substantially, so I'll opt to not have this change and keep it how it was before. This lack of intervocalic voicing is rather uncommon, so it'll serve as a fun little quirk for language A. Intervocalic voicing is also a subtype of our next category of sound changes, lenition. Lenition refers to any sort of weakening of a given sound. What exactly weakening is can take a couple of different forms, so let's look at some examples to illustrate this. First, looking at the intervocalic voicing, this involves moving the sound up on what's called the sonority hierarchy, which ranks sounds by sonority. Sonority is a loosely defined feature that involves relative loudness of the sound and or its resonance. But in any case, we have voiceless plosives at the bottom and vowels right at the top. In this type of sonorizing lenition, the weakening refers to the sound moving up on the sonority hierarchy. Another type of sonorizing lenition is called L vocalization. Here, L, which is already near the top of the sonority hierarchy, just straight up becomes a vowel, usually U or I. Let's add this feature to language B, making coda L become U if in contact with another consonant or word finally. Weakening can also take another form, exemplified by changes like spirantization and debucalization. Here, instead of nearing vocalization at the end, they drift towards overall deletion. I won't be adding any of these changes to language A or B, but given the right vibe, they can be very fun indeed. Both assimilation and lenition have their less common opposites as well, dissimilation and fortition, which I'll just briefly go over. Let's start with dissimilation. As the name implies, this is the opposite of assimilation, and the sound becomes less similar. Because of its rarity, I normally don't introduce dissimilatory processes into my languages, but I'm feeling a little adventurous today, so let's add a rule to language A. Although we've previously established that codas are rare, they do occur, so let's add a dissimilatory rule to any double stop clusters, where the first stop in the cluster becomes a fricative, giving each stop in the language a corresponding fricative to change into. Moving on to lenition's opposite, we have fortition. This involves a strengthening of the sound, or basically going back down on the sonority hierarchy. One very common form of this is final obstruent devoicing. As the name suggests, this change involves any voiced obstruents becoming voiceless at the end of words. This can be seen in languages like German, where words like Rat, meaning advice, and Rat, meaning wheel, are homophones. Since language A doesn't have any voicing, let's add this to language B. Next, let's go over apenthesis. This is a fun little phonological process in which some sort of extra sound is added into a word, and it's very useful in avoiding unwanted consonant clusters or vowel hiatus. An English example would be how the word warmth is pronounced with an added P. For now though, I'll leave both languages without any apenthesis rules. As the final process in this basic overview, we have elision, also known as deletion. As the name implies, this is simply the removal of a sound from a word. As with apenthesis, I'll leave any elision out of our example languages for now. Let's stop and zoom out a bit though. Remember the dissimilation rule we add in language A? Well, if we stop and think about it a bit, if we're just looking at a normal root word, there's not really any change to be seen. It could just be expressed with a phonotactic constraint that two stops can't cluster. However, if we add something like a suffix, assuming we have them, then the change suddenly becomes apparent. These types of changes are called sandy, and are characterized by the fact that they occur across morpheme or word boundaries, with a morpheme being the smallest linguistic unit that conveys meaning. Think of things like root words or suffixes or prefixes. Let's take this rule in language A and expand it, making it so that the dissimilation occurs even across word boundaries, which I think gives a nice bit of flavor. This interaction between morphemes and the phonological changes they cause is the main concern of morphophonology. Another example of a morphophonological change is something called vowel harmony. A complete exploration of vowel harmony is way beyond the scope of this particular video, but the gist is that all of the vowels in a given word must, by and large, harmonize with each other. That is, they must all share some sort of characteristic, such as height, backness, or rounding. Because of this, if you have any suffixes or prefixes or the like, they will very often have different forms, corresponding to whatever categories the system is concerned with. These variations in morphemes are called allomorphs, and just as allophones are all the possible sounds a phoneme can manifest itself as, allomorphs are all the forms that a given morpheme can take. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. 
Now that we've fleshed out our phonologies, complete with some extra allophony and phonological processes, it's time to move on to the next part of the process. In the next episode, we'll get into morphology and syntax and forming a morphosyntactic profile of a conlang. Thanks for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe, and this is Space Dirt, signing off.